Welcome to Where Are They Now, where we reach into the archives of Lenape, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Seneca High Schools and invite selected alumni to share their memories and fill us in on their career paths after commencement. Since Lenape's first graduating class in 1961, Shawnee's in 1972, Cherokee's in 1978, and Seneca's in 2005, over 77,000 individuals have received diplomas from these four schools. Join us now for another Lenape District alumni interview on Where Are They Now? Hello and welcome to another edition of Where Are They Now? I'm Mark Sonsini, a 1996 graduate of Cherokee High School. And today we'll be talking with another Cherokee alumnus from the class of 2006. He is Lieutenant Commander in the United States Navy, residing in Chesapeake, Virginia. I'd like to welcome Shane Bothell to the show. Shane, welcome. Mark, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you here. I'm excited to hear about your career uh, since your time at Cherokee. But first, let's go back to that time at Cherokee and talk about some of the things you were involved in. Uh, first of all, you, did you grow up in Marlton? Uh, yeah, I moved there in the uh, middle of fourth grade. So I, I grew up an Air Force brat, um, kind of moved all over, lived in Germany the first four years of my life. Okay. Um, she moved there right after the, the Berlin Wall came down, uh, a little interesting fact, and then traveled around all Europe. Uh, moved to Andrews Air Force Base uh, for four years. Uh, um, my dad was part of uh, the Air Force One unit. Um, worked out of there, and then we moved to Naples, Italy after that. Uh, lived there for a year, and then we ended up in, uh, he ended up getting transferred to Fort Dix um, up there in New Jersey, and that's how I ended up in New Jersey. Okay, very interesting. Um, and any siblings that went to Cherokee with you? Yep, I have a uh, older sister. She was a 2002 graduate, and then a younger brother that was a 2010 graduate. Okay, and you're referring to Tyler, graduated in 2010. Uh, he is also a pilot in the Navy. Uh, he's currently on the USS Eisenhower. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, he's part of the uh, Carrier Air Group wing staff uh, there on the Eisenhower, and they're they're staying busy currently out there with the current events. He's currently deployed out in the uh, Middle East. Okay. And he was part of the original JROTC program at uh, Cherokee too, right? Correct. I, I think it was stood up his senior year, if I can remember correctly. I, I wanted to say he might have been the first uh, JROTC leaders. Um, I, I don't know what they call him. We didn't have JROTC when I was there. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was one of the first ones there that helped stand it up and get it going. So it was pretty cool and pretty neat to see. Yeah, very neat. It's a very popular program uh, there today with the Naval uh, JROTC program. Very cool. Um, Let's talk about some of your activities uh, during your time at Cherokee. You were in the German Honor Society, uh, also in the Technology Student Association, or TSA, and uh, played football and baseball, and they were a big part of your time here at Cherokee. Tell me about them. Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, kind of followed suit with my sister. She took German for a uh, hand, handful of years, loved the teachers, so I kind of followed suit and jumped into it. But really enjoyed it, and it paid off because I ended up doing that in, uh, in college, had to take a language. Um, you know, and then um, freshman year, went into one of the tech classes. I think it was, uh, um, uh, I forget what it was called. It was one of the uh, engineering drawing classes with Mr. Okay. Kralik. And it was, I don't know, loved it. Thought of that, thought of that was a field I'm gonna, I was going to go into because I loved it so much. Okay. Uh, didn't end up that way in a different route, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I always grew up playing uh, baseball, football, um, and it kind of just led into that. Um, played baseball the first two years, freshman, sophomore year. Um, and then I ended up having to uh, get hurt, hurt my shoulder and needed surgery. So I chose to play football um, during those last two seasons over baseball. So I stuck okay. with football and ended up working out. Yeah, that was a good choice for you. Uh, junior year, you guys were in the playoffs. And then senior year, you ended up winning the South Jersey Group 4 championship, right? That must have been exciting. Very exciting, yeah. I mean, that's the way you want to go out, right? You want to go out as a winner. Yeah. Um, it was a fun year. Knew we had a lot of talent. Probably didn't apply as much talent as we had, but right, we started off the season 0-2 my senior year, not the ideal way to start. Mm -hmm. um, coming with a high expectation, and then we turned it around, ran right the table, um, and then end up winning the uh, South Jersey Group 4 state championship uh, in overtime against Aptogami. So it was quite the way to walk it off. Very exciting, yeah. And a lot, a lot of the coaches on those football teams made an impact on you, right? Tell me about them. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, both the baseball and football coaches made an impact, but, you know, um, Mr. Megan, Coach Glatz, uh, Mr. Agnew, Coach Porter, um, you know, uh, I think Coach DeVise was coming on. That was his first year, my senior year. But, yeah, a lot of those guys had a huge impact on uh, on, on me. You know, um, Coach Schultz, you know, he helped run the defense. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, with Coach Agnew. And it was just one of those things where, like, you love playing for those guys. Um, and it's like playing the sport, it's easier when you have good coaches and you're pointing in the right direction. Sure. And uh, let's talk about some of the other teachers uh, maybe in the classroom that had an impact on you as well. You mentioned uh, Mr. Kralik for uh, technology. Tell me about him. Yep. Yeah, he uh, – it was one of those classes you, you sign up freshman year, you don't really know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. um, and he made it fun and interesting and one of those things that, like, I every year I look forward to what the new uh, technology class that was coming out that involved uh, Mr. Kralik and – um, some type of engineering drawing, right? And so I, I found those fascinating. We started, as you advance through the years, you start getting into the computer-aided uh, courses. So like CAD, I remember right. we used, uh, uh, was it Autodesk, Rhinoceros, or something like that, mm -hmm. um, and did all the renderings and thought that was just fascinating stuff. Um, and it was always the fun class that he made very, very interesting. Very good. Uh, also, you mentioned Richard London for math, who was also a Navy grad. Uh, Karen Dooley for social studies and Mike Delgurcio uh, for English. Tell me about them briefly. Yeah, so um, first, Mr. Lubbin, right? He was a Naval Academy grad. Um, going to this, never thought I was going to go to Navy, right? Um, but I remember I sat uh, front row, like second row in, uh, in his class, taught math, and he just, that guy that always had a dad joke, um, <laughs> right? I just made class fun. He made math interesting. Um, I probably didn't apply myself as much as I should have in math, and I think he was one of those guys that helped push me. And then when I showed interest in the Naval Academy, he kind of gave me that extra boost and kind of told me in the direction I needed to go and uh, helped me out. Uh, Miss Dooley, she was one of those classes that um, – I forget the name of the class, but it was like military history, right? And I kind of thought I had an interest in military history, especially growing up, being around the military, moving around. Yeah. Um, Touring all over Europe, seeing a lot of the World War II sites. Um, but she made it fun. She was passionate about it, and she made – history just learned about history a lot of fun and enjoyable and that's probably what led me to be a history major at the naval academy okay uh, and then mr del gershio growing up i hated english always hated english class hated reading hated all that stuff um i think it was his very first year oddly enough so brand new teacher coming in and he just changed things up did things a little bit of a different way made english mm -hmm. fun uh, i think we read a uh, catcher and rye that year um okay. which is you know a very famous book for sure. many reasons but uh, he made it fun, interesting, and um, we had great conversations, learned a lot. But it was just one of those things I look back and I was like, man, that was the first time I ever thought English class was enjoyable. Um, so it was definitely an impact on, on me as a student. That's great. Now, you mentioned um, you, that you didn't think you would go into the military. A, why did you think, coming from a military family, why did you think you didn't want to do that? And B, what did you think you did want to do at the time? So... Uh, didn't want to go in the military because the amount of times that we moved growing up, right? Moving around. Every time you, um, you got used to something, got comfortable, made a lot of friends. Yeah. Um, we're in an organization. It was like, boom, all right, we're moving. Mm -hmm. um, so that aspect that I, did, I didn't like, right? Um, constantly moving around. I, I was one of those people that always wanted to be around family. I was when, you know, I grew up, every time you go visit your grandparents or your cousins, you're like, man, I just wish I lived close by. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't it. Um, and then what led me to the military? Um, so I ended up getting recruited for football uh, to go to the Naval Academy. Okay. Uh, um, and I think it was my – it was one of the things. Coach Megan told me, uh, I think junior year, like, hey, send out some tapes, right? Have your, like, your top choice, middle choice, and then some fallback schools. And I remember um, originally Army West Point reached out my junior year, and my dad was like, absolutely not. You'll never do the Army. Um, right? My dad was an Air Force guy. He said, you'll never do Army. Uh, so I was like, hey, Naval Academy, it's close – close to home it's only two hours away i'll throw it in there right um you can get a free education out of it so i did that senior year rolled up uh coach buddy green walked in the office and he's like hey you're gonna come and visit naval academy and i was like okay um <laughs> went down there loved it had a great visit watched them beat tulane uh right they had the leapfrogs jumping into the stadium and ever since then i was like oh yep i think i need to go here That's um right funny. free education uh guaranteed job afterwards um Right, you're just enamored and you see everything and you're like, oh, this is great. And then you, you get there and it's a different story when you go to Naval Academy. <laughs> not, as, not as glorious as it looks. Yeah. All right. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, before we move on, any uh, spe special memories from high school? You, you mentioned uh, the people and the teammates that you had during your time here. Yeah. It, it, you know, looking back on high school, high school is one of those things where like, it's a carefree lifestyle. Life's easy, right? You live at home. Uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have great parents where they did a lot for me, right? Um, so I didn't have to worry about much. And it's just, it was enjoyable to walk in that school every day. I think the, the people were great. The teachers were phenomenal. Um, and especially now that I moved out of the area and I have kids in schools, 
you, you realize it's a really good school district. You really get a great education there. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so you uh, graduate from Cherokee. You know you're going to the Naval Academy. Uh, the first year you started out the Naval Academy uh, Preparatory School. Tell me about that. Yep, so um, it's kind of like the Navy's way of having a red shirt here. So uh, okay. um, <laughs> Uh, my senior, right as I signed my letter of intent to go to the Navy, uh, I remember I walked into Coach Paul Johnson's office. I didn't know how signing day worked, and he was like, hey, you're going to sign right here, but the thing is you're going to go to prep school. And I was like, oh, okay, great. I don't know what that entails. Um, everyone was like, hey, you're going to make you're gonna make some money. So we get paid like $860 a month, which, you know, as an 18-year-old, like, hey, I'm rich. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, you go up to Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, um, you learn, learn, you study the uh, chemistry, physics, um, pre-calc. Um, and you work on those core classes while also playing football and getting stronger, right? The big thing there was to get stronger, bigger and stronger. Right. Um, it was enjoyable, really cold up there in the winter, uh, beautiful in the spring, summer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, a, what I want to say, 360 people max okay. in a small little area of the base. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting year. I, it was probably, as I look back, Academically, it probably didn't help me. It probably made me a lazy student because everything I'd done, I'd already done in high school. Okay. Um, but getting adjusted to the military and the way the academy works, that was a huge benefit because I probably would have quit the academy had I walked right into it. Okay. So you do that, and then you go over to the academy uh, in 2007, and you end up getting your uh, bachelor's in history, right, like you talked about? Uh, that became yeah. an interest of yours? Yeah. So uh, oddly enough, I started out as an uh, ocean engineering major. Um, and I quickly learned, uh, right, if you're a student athlete uh, in college, um, being an athlete becomes a full-time job. So I was trying to balance a full-time job and then, you know, maintaining your grades. Yeah. Uh, I quickly learned engineering was, was not, not for me. Um, didn't have the time to sit there and stay up till, you know, midnight, 1 a.m. like some of the other football players that weren't engineers. Okay. Uh, so, yep, my grades tanked, so I uh, focused on just graduating. So I ran over to the history building and transferred to history. Okay. And it, it was a great great thing i really enjoyed it uh fortunate enough to have some pretty good teachers learn something the focus really is military history um right and then you realize that you're going through a lot of this that you're surrounded by a lot of military history um yeah. just there on the yard at the naval academy and then obviously also another uh, experience big experience you had was playing football there at the academy and you were on one of the winningest uh classes in in academy history right tell us about some of the accomplishments that you guys had while you were there yeah, um, yeah, we, I was fortunate enough to be on some really good teams. Um, you know, um, a couple classes before, so I want to say uh, after they lost to 2001, um, they had a streak going against Army. We um, were undefeated, walked in 2007. Um, I was fortunate enough, never lost Army. Um, and then, you know, at the time, a couple years before that, Air Force was the powerhouse. Um, I walked in as a freshman. And, Boom, we were rolling against Air Force, so it was every year the expectation was to win the CIC, the Commander-in-Chief trophy, right, and go, get, go meet the President at the White House. Uh, unfortunately, I lost him my senior year to, um, at Air Force. Um, that one still haunts me today, but uh, <laughs> it, it was still a great career, right? Had the opportunity to go. Um, we beat Notre Dame three out of four years since I was there. Almost beat okay. them my sophomore year, 28-21 Baltimore. Um, but, yeah, I had the, you know, the chance to play in South Bend, beat uh, Notre Dame in South Bend. Um, had the chance to play Ohio State at Ohio State. Very cool. Uh, I lost them by four uh, in the final minutes. Um, my junior year, we ended up playing Missouri, um, which we beat them handedly in the bowl game. And that was a team that had all sorts of talent. I think they had three first-round draft picks on that football team. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, over my career, I was fortunate enough to play uh, against several NFL players, um, some really good college football teams, but all together, it was, it was the football experience about the group of guys that you were there with, right? Um, that's the only reason, that's the only way you make it through the Naval Academy is the group of guys that you're there with. They get you through. And I think we leaned on each other to get us through all four years. Sure. And what you played in four bowl games, correct? Correct. Yep. Uh, played in the uh, Poinsettia Bowl twice, played in the Eagle Bank Bowl, which was in Washington, D.C., my sophomore year, and then the Texas Bowl my junior year, which was probably my favorite one. Yeah. Very cool. And then the Army Navy game uh, during those times was that in Philadelphia at that time? So my freshman year was in Baltimore. Um, okay. I didn't dress for that one. Um, and then the uh, last remaining three years it was in Philadelphia, and that that was always awesome. Really coming home and playing Army Navy, you know, the biggest game of the year, right there yeah. in your back. At the link, right? At the link. Yep. Very cool. So that was exciting. Awesome. I remember growing up, you know, in high school when the link was being built and Eagles debuted it. 
back in the early 2000s, right? And then you finally get a chance to go play there. It was awesome. Yeah, very cool. All right, so you're in the Navy, and at, at this point, or, or I guess at what point, I should say, um, have you decided like you're going to make a career out of being in the Navy, or are you thinking you're going to do something else after the Academy, or where are you at at that point? Uh, so, yeah, it, so all along the Academy, you kind of get exposure to all the different uh, platforms, right? So the Navy encompasses both Marine Corps and Navy. So obviously there's the surface side, um, you know, driving ships, working on ships, um, Navy Air, and then there's more Marine Corps ground, Marine Corps Air, and then there's special spec ops. New didn't want to do spec ops, right? It's not for me. Um, not not going to go out there and be the tip of the spear doing all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, thought originally I wanted to go Marine Corps ground because that's what you know, I would say like 70% of the football players end up doing. Okay. So I went into a summer training with Marines, realized, hey, that's not for me. Um, when they say they want to go ruck, it's, hey, throw in an 80-pound pack, go for a slow jog, and then all of a sudden stop, count rifles, this and that, and you do it in the rain. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. <laughs> So I ended up choosing uh, aviation because I was like, hey, I like my eight hours of sleep, sleep under a nice, warm, comfortable roof. <laughs> uh, and honestly, it's been the greatest decision I've ever made, right? I, I couldn't have been more lucky uh, to fall into what I, what I got into as career-wise. That's great. So you're commissioned in uh, 2011. And at that point, mm-hmm. uh, you go to uh, flight school in Florida. And that takes about two years to go through there? Yeah, so it, it's like a whole progression. So you check in, you check into the na- main naval station down there in Pensacola, and you go through a, a, pretty much a ground phase. At the time, it was called API. Um, I forget what it stands for. It's, it's since changed names a handful of times. Um, and it's all an academic thing, right? It's a, kind of like a weeding out process. So you do uh, four weeks of academics, and then there's two weeks of um, the swimming, uh, uh, land survival, um, you just start doing like the hyperbaric compression chamber and all of these all these crazy things. Okay. Um, kind of like a weeding out process. And then you move up to primary and you get trained uh, fixed wing training first. So you get about eighty to ninety hours in the uh, Texan T six, um, learning basic uh, fundamentals of flight and then also basic instruments. From there, you kind of select whether you want to go jets, uh, maritime patrol, uh, or helos. I knew going into flight school, hey, I'm, I'm a helo guy. Okay. I don't like wearing the Austria mask. I don't wear, like wearing the G suit. I like being low, and I also like talking to the people that are right next to me. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I was the oddball in API when they were like, hey, because I would say, you know, 95% of the class is like, hey, I want to go Jets. So, you know, right. everybody's, everybody's seen Top Gun. Uh, everybody wants to be Maverick. Right. I'm like, nope, I want to go helicopters. And so they're <laughs> like, right, oddball in the back of the class. So we'll make sure he goes helicopters. So, <laughs> fortunate enough, yeah, I, I'm going to go on helicopters. You uh, fly the Bell 206 Jet Ranger. Um, you get qualified in that, you get about 120 hours in that, um, getting qualified in instruments and, and basic fundamentals of flying a helicopter. Uh, and then from there, you kind of put in your preference of location uh, or platform. Okay. And once again, I knew going into it because I, I had a buddy that did 53s. I, you know, I had a teacher that was a, a 53 pilot at the prep school that I was interested in. I was like, hey, I want to go uh, Navy 53s. Uh, so then I put that as my number one choice. Fortunate enough, I did well, and the timing worked out that I got selected to go uh, fly the MH-53 for the Navy. Okay. And that's in, you you earn your wings in October 2013, correct? Correct. Yep, October 13, 2013. All right. And you're selected to fly, as you said, the MH-53E called the Sea Dragon. Tell us what kind of uh, helicopter that is and what it's used for. So uh, the MH-53 uh, EC Dragon, uh, it's used for helicopter mine countermeasures as our primary, uh, so we can tow an array of five devices looking for acoustic, magnetic, um, you know, mechanical, more influence mines. Um, so we go out and look for mines, right? Basically uh, IEDs for underwater. Um, uh, so you take like a $10,000 mine and it's a threat against, you know, a billion dollar warship. So our right. job is go out there and make sure there aren't mines in the water. Um, and then, uh, you know, when we're not doing that, we have secondary missions of uh, vertical onboard delivery or heavy lift. So we can lift uh, externally up to 25,000 pounds with it, uh, internally based upon your fuel, fuel loads. Um, the thing becomes like a, a flying school bus, right? We can take up to 55 people in the back or probably like, I don't know, 15 to 20,000 pounds of cargo uh, wow. folded out in the back. That's huge. So um, now when you first, uh, I- you are a fleet replacement pilot as well. Is that 
tell me how that relates to the, the countermeasures unit. Is that a part of that, or is that a separate kind so of So you, uh, you come up, after you get winged in flight school, you select where you want to go, you get assigned to where you're going, and you're assigned to a fleet replacement squadron, right? And then you okay. officially become a fleet replacement pilot, and your job is to get qualified in the basic fundamentals of that aircraft. So you get qualified in a fleet model uh, helicopter. Um, that takes about um, what, uh, six to eight months. Uh, I was held up a little bit. Um, we There was a mishap with HM-14 where uh, one of the 53s crashed right off the coast. Oddly enough, it was, uh, one, of our, one of my class advisors was the first flight as he was back in the squadron. We're actually coming up on the 10-year anniversary of it on Monday. Um, yeah, that was, that was a bad day. Uh, lost three really good yeah. uh, individuals in that one. Um, so I was a little delayed there. And then in uh, July of 2014, um, completed my syllabus, uh, completely the rest of my training, and then went over to HM15, um, and then did three and a half year tour there. So after you do your uh, three and a half tour there, you're uh, transferred to Squadron 12, and that's basically the same thing, but in a training role, correct? Yeah, so you uh, you do your three years at 15, right, and you work through the syllabus becoming like a, a you know, glorified co-pilot to, uh, hey, now I'm signing for the aircraft, I'm legally responsible. Um, and I'm qualified as an aircraft commander. Um, and then from there, you kind of, um, once you're done your time at uh, 15, my first JO tour, I guess, in the Navy, other people would say, yeah, you can select become a fleet replacement instructor. Um, okay. So, yeah, and I became an uh, instructor at HM-12 uh, to teaching people now how to fly the MH-53. And what kind of crew do you have um, on the 53? Is it uh, just a couple so, of years uh, pilots or...? Just, yeah, just a basic crew. You have two pilots and then a minimum of two air crew in the back. Um, okay. Obviously, depending on the mission, is depending on the size of the crew, the air crew uh, component in the back. And then after doing uh, training the new pilots, then you go back to Squadron 15, but now you're the department head. How long or at what point did that happen where you transferred back to 15? So I transferred back to 15 in August of 2020 okay. um, and then uh, spent three weeks and then immediately shipped right out on deployment uh, to be the assistant officer in charge out in Bahrain, um, which is out in the Middle East, which is, I did, what, four deployments there in my total time over the years. And is that, the, uh, when you're there, is the same kind of missions where you're, uh, you know, over the water and, and looking for mines and protecting the... Yep. The... So we, uh, our main main mission out there is, yeah, we do airborne mine countermeasure. So it's like a deterrence right there, right? Making sure Iran doesn't mine the straits of Hormuz. Okay. Um, so we'll go out and we'll do surveys, making, looking, you know, checking the bottom of the ocean floor, making sure there's no mines. Uh, with the secondary mission of uh, uh, vertical onboard delivery. So there's always usually a, a large uh, either carrier or LHD um, floating out there. And we'll take, uh, you know, parts, people, Amazon packages all out to the boats. And we'll do these VOD runs back and forth. We're not doing AMCM. Now, when you're doing these types of missions, when you're you're over in Bahrain doing these missions, what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, you know, danger is there uh, to you guys at that time? Obviously, it's not a time of war, but I imagine there's still some some danger in what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, there's there's always danger when you're out there. Um, there's a lot of countries around the world that don't like us. Right. Um, not everyone's friendly. Um, but I will say, like, my part of the job, I never I've never felt threatened. Um, right. I've been to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, um, UAE, flown all around. Obviously, you, you run into Iranian assets here and there. Right. A little banner over the radio. You know, they'll claim like, hey, you're in our territorial waters. And we're like, oh, they're in international waters. Stuff like that. Never thought there was yeah. a threat. Um, we don't have high tech stuff on the 53. You know, there's no flare, so I can't zoom in, see what they're doing on the boat. Okay. Um, I mean, I've seen the intel, seen the pictures of them pointing RPGs, guns, and all that stuff at us, but never noticed a threat from my end. Uh, nor did I ever feel threatened. Well, that's good. Um, so you spent 10 years uh, on the Dragon and 1,500 hours, uh, and then in November 2023. You're transferred to the United States Fleet Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia, which is where you are now. So tell me about what you're doing now. Yep. So uh, kind of removed from the, from the cockpit for the first time in my career, which is odd, right? I'm used to uh, being out there doing things. Now I'm sitting behind a computer screen. Um, I work in uh, work at Fleet Forces, like you said, for a four-star admiral. 
uh, in the N1 office and the Global Force Management office. Okay. And basically, we just do uh, sourcing. We source people for individual augmentation. So if there's a, a major event going on around the world, we need extra bodies. You know, bill it here and there. We'll, we'll augment people here and there. Uh, on my specific job, I augment people for exercise. So people request support for an exercise. And I, I source out to the TICOM saying, hey, I need bodies. And then, hey, I fill these billets to help this exercise out, make sure that the fleet's getting what they need. Okay. Do you miss flying? Absolutely. Yeah, I've done some cool things in my flying career. Um, flown the aircraft uh, all the way down, pretty much up and down the East Coast. Uh, like I said, I've flown all over the Middle East in that thing. I've done hurricane uh, after Hurricane Maria, we did Disco had a relief, right? So we got it's really rewarding when you get to help people. Sure. Uh, so I, yeah, I've done some really cool things, done flyovers, all that fun stuff. Uh, okay, let's talk about your family life a little bit. You're married to your high school's sweetheart from Cherokee, Jennifer Fusco, um, okay. also a 2006 grad. How did you guys uh, meet or start dating? So oddly enough, we've known each other probably since middle school. Okay. Uh, I think there's this infamous picture of us from an eighth grade dance where we're in the same picture and probably had no idea. That's funny. Um, but we ended up uh, really meeting and talking junior high school, and then that's when we started dating at the end of junior year. Um, and it's one of those things that, yeah, she's become my best friend, you know, instantly. Like, things just clicked, and, yeah, uh, yeah she's, a, she's a rock star. She's, you know, the rock of the family. They hold it down. Um, and she's amazing. And what... Was she, did she continue her ed education while you were at the academy? She did. She went to Philadelphia University, um, you know, commuting. She lived over there and then also worked over here in Marlton uh, on the border uh, as a bartender and server. And then, uh, yeah, she got her degree in interior design and then uh, followed me down to flight school. And ever since then, I've been moving her around. Luckily enough, we've been in Norfolk uh, or Chesapeake, Virginia for the past 10 years. Yeah. So we've been kind of one spot able to put down some roots there um, yep absolutely and you have four kids tell me about them four kids yeah olivia landon mckinley and cole uh, ages uh, 11 9 5 and 4 and they keep us busy they're very active I bet. Uh, amazing kids right um my oldest daughter olivia she does horseback riding so uh that, that takes a lot of her time right mm -hmm. um my, uh oldest son landon does ice hockey he does a lot of travel ice hockey uh, it's been in love with that. And then uh, McKinley does dance. She also, she's also a type 1 diabetic. Um, so we're a big advocate for that. You know, that, that takes up a lot of time, a yeah. lot of learning. And then Cole, our youngest one, he's just a little pit bull. Uh, he's probably going to be bigger than anyone. Um, but he also does ice hockey as well. But, yeah, he, he just gets, he's a rink rat. He gets dragged everywhere. <laughs> and you help coach, is it uh, Landon's or Cole's team? Landon's, yeah, I helped coach Landon's uh, hockey team this year. Um, okay. So, obviously, being at the squadron, you're constantly, the flight schedule's in flux, right? You don't know yeah. what you're doing the day proper. So, I, did, I couldn't help coach. Um, and then moving to Fleet Forces this year, I kind of had steady working hours. I was like, hey, I'll, let me jump in to help coach. I know very little about ice hockey, um, but I happen to know a little bit about sports, um, you know, discipline and work ethic. So, that's why I was asked to come out and help and instill that in some of these kids. Very cool. And tell me about the work that you guys are doing with um, the JDRF. Yep. So uh, pretty much run by my wife. Like I said, she's amazing. Um, we help uh, run a team, help support the JDRF here in the local chapter. Um, we have a big uh, uh, fundraiser every May, I want to say it is, April, May, okay. uh, for my daughter, uh, for Team Big and Brave uh, is what we call it. Um, yes. Yeah, so we anything we can do to help uh, bring awareness and then support uh, type 1 diabetes especially for juvenile diabetes, yeah. uh, we're here to do it. And the whole family gets involved in those, right? When you whole have family, walks yeah. and, when I say the yeah, whole family, we get friends, family, everybody comes down, uh, pitches in, they all come for the walk. There's a walk down here on the uh, Virginia Beach Ocean front. Uh, it's just a great thing to help uh, show support for her and then other juvenile diabetes. That's great. So tell me about uh, some plans for the future. What's on the horizon for you? Oh, on the horizon. Um, yeah, things are starting to slow down now. I'm not in the cockpit. Um, so I have uh, approximately, what, six, five or six years left in the Navy before I can officially okay. retire. So the goal is to ride that out, uh, finish my time in the Navy, uh, collect retirement, and then hopefully maybe move back to the Philadelphia area. Um, 
I have uh, fleet two more years at Fleet Forces. Uh, after that, I'm hoping to maybe be selected for Reserve Center CO somewhere. Okay. Um, I think there's there's spots all around the Northeast that'd be the ideal location, but really I'll go wherever. Terrific. Well. Shane, thanks so much. Uh, it's been great catching up with you today and, and great hearing about all your success since your time at Cherokee. Thank you so much for your service, and uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. Hey, Mark, I appreciate it. Take care now. Thank you. And that's all for this episode of Where Are They Now? For other Lenape District alumnus interviews, check us out online at youtube.com slash Lenape District TV. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.